Welcome to Wisdom Exchange TV. My name is Suzanne S. Stevens, Chief Edge Optimizer for the Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives. One of our initiatives is the Ignite Excellence Foundation, which our goal is to inspire, develop, and invest in future women leaders in Africa. With that goal in mind, we produce Wisdom Exchange TV, where we'll learn from leading ladies, their area of expertise, as well as leadership lessons. Men and women of all disciplines will learn from these change agents in business, philanthropy, education, and politics. You'll be inspired by the women we're about to interview today. Please join us on Wisdom Exchange TV fan page on Facebook, and you'll hear the latest and the greatest as we travel all over Africa interviewing people like the women we're about to interview today. We are in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania with a leading lady in business and a multinational at that, Mwavida Makomba, Chief Officer, Corporate Affairs, Business and Enterprise Sales for Vodacom Tanzania Limited. At a young age, Mwavida was a business founder and pioneer, now a board member of East African Business Council, executive at a multinational, and a recent, recently she was actually acknowledged as Fortune Magazine's Most Powerful Women in 2011. I think we'll learn a lot from Mwavida, and I'm so glad we finally got the opportunity to get together because you're such a busy woman. Thank you so much. It's <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank Between you. Uh, media coming in and out, it's, I know you're a very busy woman. You travel travel quite a bit with your, with your job. Yes. Now, as somebody always in public affairs with Vodacom, yes. uh, what is it that draws you to public affairs? It's a tough question, but I believe I like to give good news and I like to people out there are always waiting to hear what is happening, what is good for them. So I'm in the public space because I like to give good news, that's one. And two, also connect with people in different levels and in different things that we do. I believe about me that I'm here for the service of the others and public affairs is that. But let's face it, in public affairs you don't always have to give good news. Sometimes you have to give bad news. It's true, but it's news that is really it's supposed to be given. Right. For always for the good. It could be bad news, but at the end of the day, it could deliver something good. So if it's bad news, everybody wants to be told one way or another to know and move on. Let's let's focus on on that for a bit. You know, as a person that specializes in public affairs, there must be a strategy that you use. Let's say, and let's. Let's take Vodacom out of the mix, just yes. as a public affairs officer. If there's bad news that you have to give, what are some of the techniques you use in order to give that bad news to the public? Well, first to realize what the bad news has, what impact it will have on the, on the audience that you want to deliver it to. Often it's bad, it's a shocker. But then you have to find ways of which you can deliver it in a way that they can really resonate with that bad news in a nice way. But the key thing is really looking at the impact and finding ways of making it, mitigating that impact and delivering it in, 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 in a really, in the most possible, positive way you can. Sometimes you can't be positive. I mean, it's just bad news. Is there sort of a philosophy that you have? Let's just either say it as it is, or is there sort of a philosophy that you always take when you're delivering any kind of news to the public? Well, it's simple. It has to be told. Therefore, I just have to man up and tell it as it is. Again, I will try and do it in the most possible, you know, humblest and softest way possible for people to really resonate. But I believe people always feel you when you deliver the news, however bad they are. And they'll go like, okay, it's bad, but thank you for telling us anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just how you deliver it. Public affairs is one thing. Another thing is technology. I mean, you're an executive woman in the technology field, and as we all know, in Africa, technology is incredible, um, how it's leaped and bound and skipped steps and all sorts of things. What draws you to a career in technology? I always wanted to be where I could be a service to others. And in Africa, technology is that thing. In 2000, in Tanzania, there was no mobile phones. Today, 10 years later, 11 years later, half of the people have a mobile phone. So people used to travel from one area to another full day to go and deliver a message or to go and give money to 
to their families and peers. Today they will just call, they will just SMS, or they'll send the money on mobile money transfer. So being behind and, and, and marketing this information to tell people that now we have mobile technology and driving that agenda to them for them to understand and them to adopt. Because understanding and having technology is one thing, but having a society that was not used to technology adopt it and make it a part of their lives is a fabulous thing. And I'm part of that, so it's, it's really great. It's a great feeling today to see um, 27,000 million people in Tanzania use mobile phones, where there was completely none, and it's because of what we do to push them to adopt it. Their lives is much better today because of that. I can so, see you actually really mean that. Like you're glowing when you, you say that their lives are better today because you're able to do that. Now, looking at women in, in certain careers, you know, I've had the pleasure of interviewing in five countries so far, and there is a tendency for women to go in, down certain paths. Either they were brought up to be, you know, a teacher or whatever the case may be. Um, where do you see the opportunity for women in technology? That's a hard one, but what I, what I, what I feel the role of women in technology could be is there are different ways that we resonate with technology. Women have different needs. Men have different needs. Young people have different needs in technology. So once I'm here, I know how my lifestyle is, or women in rural Tanzania would, would want to make their lives easier. So our role is to inform technology to come up with services and products and, and technology that resonate with people and that could be useful for women specifically in rural Africa or in Africa generally. That's the biggest role possible. For instance, M-Pesa, today's a money uh, uh, transfer, transferring, you know, using your, your cell phone. Today, because I am here, in this, in this organization, and I understand the need for women in rural Tanzania, we are able to launch a, a, a loan system through a mobile phone to the bottom of the pyramid women in rural Tanzania today. And, you know, 90% of Tanzania is unbanked. Women store their money under the mattresses. It's expensive to buy a mobile phone. So today we loan them money in groups, interest-free, and they adopt a PESA, and somehow today they have a bank in their hand. But that's because we could influence technology to come up with this system to, to create that. So that's a bigger role for women, really, in technology. Look at what's the need for other women or for other people, and then inform technology, because anything can be created, but with an informed uh, perception and what you can deliver. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for women in multinationals? People think that, especially in Africa, that to make a change, you either have to be a politician. Yeah, that's it. Everybody wants to be a member of parliament and a minister. But I believe our society is changed in, in many levels. Civil society is very important. Politics is equally important. Uh, businesses is also important. However, technology is, is, is massive. And to, to work for multinational companies, you drive a lot of agendas that are good for development in our country. Whether you work for a lending institution, you can somehow pull through other women, pull through leaders, and really drive agendas. So I believe uh, I can change a lot of lives being in, working in a multinational. I don't have to be a politician, or I don't have to be in civil society. There's a lot of opportunities to drive change through working for big companies. It's been said that you're, you're a key player in the growth to becoming the largest telecommunications company in Tanzania. Well, that's a, that's a big statement, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is a big statement. And, and, you know, I also found that a very interesting statement from where you, you're coming from, that, you know, from corporate affairs, that, that that's what it's been said about you. So uh, tell us a little bit about some strategies that, that you did to help make Vodacom so well regarded in Tanzania. I joined in 2008, and uh, by then, the company didn't really have a, a public affairs, affairs strategy. Their relationship with government and the people was 
not so good because uh, it was a new company, it was a South African company and it came in as, and remember in Tanzania we only opened up uh, investment in, in the 90s, late 90s. So there was a lot of people were not quite welcoming to multinationals. So you needed a strategy where the Tanzanians could understand that we are here to empower them as much as we will make money. So through that we formulated our CSR agenda foundation to show that we really care about the communities that we are in and we really did this from the heart. We didn't go to areas where we wanted to put a tower. No. We went to areas where we were not even there. The opposition was there. You find areas where Airtel was. We went and changed life there because we really cared about this this country. And we also had a strategy to engage with government for them to understand who we are and what we can do for this country, technologically wise, not only just selling their time and connecting people, but also connecting governments and what can businesses enjoy from our connectivity. So that was an agenda to really go out and tell people, tell the public, tell government and all stakeholders that we are here for you. We could work together to change Tanzania. So that worked quite well and today, well, we did a, a reputation survey December last year, and Borukomi is number one in Tanzania. The lesson of that is, is really quite important, is you're, as an organization starting as an entrepreneur or as an organization that's a multinational, it is looking at the variety of stakeholders that are going to be affected by your presence and ensure that they understand what your goals are, absolutely, and and communicate those those goals. Exactly. So, which is which is really huge, rather than just showing up. <laughs> absolutely, it's very important, and also for them to understand what they can benefit. Mm -hmm. So we give messaging information. This is what we are, and this is where you can fit in and benefit as well, mm -hmm. hugely from all being here. I say this with respect. Yes. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but I know you're you're fairly still fairly young. Uh, and yet you, you've established yourself in, in a multinational, you're now number one in this country as far as the reputation as you just said, and that's, that has to largely be due to you, so kudos. Uh, what, what do you see other women in positions, executive positions, what are some of the mistakes that they can or you've seen being made when they're trying to create a foothold in that organization or in a presence to the public? Well, if you are in too much of a hurry, because sometimes when you set an agenda, it takes a long time. So it's baby steps. So women, we sometimes we tend to want to do things very fast and see results the next day. And there's a lot of pressure from organization, you know, multinationals, they need results now. So you, that may tend to create you to lose your focus. So no, everything, it's, if you have your strategy, take the time it needs. Because for, for my case, for instance, to establish rapport and relationship with people and with stakeholders is a long time and it's a trust issue. So you have to go through the process and never be tempted to just cut cross and get there because eventually you don't get there. So patient, however, work hard get there eventually. Is there a lot of women in multinationals in Tanzania at the executive level? There are quite some, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are, there are some, but a lot, a lot. I mean, corporate is dominated by men in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to the boardrooms, you find one or two women. So it's really not there. There's a lot of middle management women, mm -hmm. but not a lot at, uh, at the top. So let's talk about that. And, and you know, just your perspective on what would it take for those middle managers to sort of get through the barriers? I mean, internationally there's barriers. Yes. I don't care if I'm in Canada, United States, or Tanzania. There's barriers everywhere. They're, they're just le different levels of barriers, especially since your economy opens later on. Yes. There's different levels of barriers, of course. What suggestions do you have for um, beyond patients, for those women to get through some of those barriers? Hard work, really, in aggressiveness. Women, we tend to, you know, sometimes you have ideas, you don't speak up. We are quite humble, we, we are doers. You know, we just go and do it. And, and corporate is quite aggressive. So if you, you, you do it, but make sure you really do it and you get out there and deliver. But one thing that I know in Tanzania is, 
we need to work harder. Women need to work harder and, and they have to show what they do to be able to get somewhere. And not just because it's easy, men are quite aggressive and tough and they will get out there and they'll share it, they'll steal your idea and go and sell it. So really, really be out there, show what you do. If you know you are excellent, make sure people know that you are excellent and you do the job. But most importantly is hard work. Nothing comes easy. Sometimes women, you think you put on some high heels, you go around and you become a chief officer. It doesn't happen like that. Excellency is not an accident. You really have to work for it. So if women have to, to want to get there, they really have to work hard. I'm going to ask you about what work hard means. Yes. Because to everybody that means something very different. You're right. Uh, and I say that because I work very hard. And I watch people work and they may think that's hard. But to me, they've just woken up. Okay. So, so when you say work hard, what does that mean to you? Hard work for me means doing every ordinary thing in an extraordinary manner, whatever it is. That way, you are just not a mediocre. You will always stand above. I guess I know everybody's um, uh, above is different. People can work hard, but that's their best, really. But I believe when you do your best and it's good enough, you can get somewhere one day. So really try and do normal things in an extraordinary manner because they will always be different and they will always stand above. And you know, fall through. If you are given a task, finish it. And finish it extraordinarily. You know, and, 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 and that for me is hard work and really giving your, your own to a cause that is, that is in front of you. You also mentioned, too, is letting people know. Yes. Now, my understanding culturally mm. is that often people in general, but particularly women, don't uh, fly their own flag, if you will. They don't say that I've done something fantastic, which is one of the reasons we're doing Wisdom Exchange TV, to be honest, is to fly the flag for successful African women. How would you suggest that women start communicating that they've done something successfully, but still recognizing the fact that culturally, they're inhibited. I know, and that perhaps that's why a lot of women in Tanzania or in Africa are in middle management or not there, because of exactly that, like you said. So, I think we, we should do it. There is no reason why we should, we should not do it. But women should also be inspired by other women who have done it already. Like, I look at other women in Tanzania, Mama Asher is me to just name a few. She is out there. She, she's, she was a Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. She, we could always see what she's done because she makes sure that she is delivering a course. She's not talking about herself like I am good, I'm excellent, but she's doing something to impact and bring in change. And people will see it. So when you're bringing change, people have to see it and you have to talk about it. Because you've done it. And also you inspire other people. I have people working for me here, my, my, my direct reportees. I have four girls and one guy. Because I believe in, in, in women. And I make sure they are seen. I make sure they sing their song. They tell what they do. I put them up to present to, to management so that they are seen. And they are seen that they have done it. Another tendency of women is to stop other women from being successful. I personally believe that women's development will be brought by women themselves. And we can help other women come out there. So we should start talking about it. We should start really going out there and saying what we do. We are stronger, we are more passionate, we work better. It's about time that we talk about that attribute of ours and we use it for our own success. I couldn't agree with you more, and, and I like the, your, your concept of the cause. You know, once you're behind a cause, it's easier to talk about the cause yes. to be heard rather than talking about yourself exactly. to, be, to be heard. Where do you think is the best foray for a woman in the multinational? What, is it in public affairs, or is it in a sales capacity or marketing capacity? Do you have any insight into the best way to work for a multinational and where a woman's intuitiveness and, and drive could really be useful? So if I'm starting out saying, hmm, I, I would like to go here, I want to work for a multinational, which road should, 
I believe women should go to where they can be most useful. It doesn't matter whether it's marketing or it's, it's engineering, but where you can deliver the most value for yourself as a person and also for the organization. You know, you, you don't want to go into marketing when you're really um, an engineer gig, but you, because you can deliver a lot of value right there. So first, find out what you're really good at and what you, and what you can grow into and again, contribute to the organization most effectively and the best way you can. So anywhere, it's, it doesn't matter, as long as it's where you see you fit the best and can grow into and can deliver. Because one of the things to work, you have to really love your job and be happy to go to work and know you're growing, sometimes maybe not career-wise, but as a person, which is also equally important. Now that you're the uh, Chief Officer for Corporate Affairs and Business Enterprise and Sales, yes. which it was marketing before, yes. now Enterprise Sales is a whole new monster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a whole new area. Um, do you have any sales advice for companies trying to go after large pieces of business? It's a new area for me, as you said, and um, it's extremely exciting because we're selling technology to people to make their lives easier. So, first, to sell is selling and, uh, and getting you to connect into my network or into buying into my product is one thing. But making sure I service you and you're happy to stay with me is a whole lot of thing. So, you want to be able to support your clients. For me, that's the biggest thing. If you sell something, it's one but support after sales support, continuous support is very key. So don't sell if you cannot support it. So shifting to you personally, sort of what is the biggest impact that you feel you've made in your career so far? Well, um, recently I ran the foundation, the foundation in 2006, and took over part of the corporate affairs is running the Vodacom Foundation, which is our CSR way for organization. So we, we've come a long way, uh, because again, we like to give from our heart. But recently, um, last year, in, in, last year in 2001, we started a program with the CCBRT hospital here. I don't know if you're aware of this, this, this condition that happens to women. So, uh, because women could not come in the hospital because they live far in rural Tanzania, they don't have the bus fare. That's one. Two, they're not even aware that they have a disease that can be cured within 30 minutes of operation. So we devised a motor to communicate to these women that if you have fistula you can get cured and it's for free in the hospital. All you need is to get to the hospital. But how do you do that? There's so many barriers. So we had we created ambassadors around the country for CCBRT. This was a, a, a personal feel for it because I believe no woman should have fistula and live with it. Because it's 30 minutes cure and, and what is associated with the disease is inhumane. No woman today should have that. And there are 24,000 of those women in this country today. And every day, 3,000 more women get fistula. And there is no treatment. So the backlog is growing and it's massive. And, and it's a horrible disease. We don't want to get into that. But no woman should suffer from that. So we said, this is our mission. We want to try and operate as many women as possible. So we had ambassadors around the country who could be anybody, a teacher or somebody working in a church or a mosque. These are the guys who will look up for women with fistula because they don't come out. It's a taboo, they hide. So ambassadors will look for these women. Once they find them, they will call a, a toll-free number that will find a woman with fistula at the hospital. We would send a bus fare to that woman via Impesa, regardless where they are in Tanzania. They will draw the money. The ambassador will put the woman with fistula to come to Darasa for treatment. Once a woman arrives at the hospital, we send a token to the ambassador, three dollars, at the thank you. So since we put up this model, uh, the number of women coming to the hospital grew to sixty percent. It was like magic. So I, I also sit on the board, the board of the Vodafone Group Foundation to represent Africa in London. So we sit every five times a year, really discuss about our mandate as Vodafone globally, what we're doing to change lives. So I presented what I do, what we did here in Tanzania to the board of the World Fund Foundation, and they were moved because it uses our technology. The idea for us is we can use as much technology as we can to change lives. So it's using a pest sign, of course, we have these ambassadors. 
So the, I was invited last year to go and present to the senior leadership team meeting of Vodafone, the top 200 of Vodafone globally. So I went over and spoke about this program and how it works. From that meeting last year in June, the entire Vodafone management decided to raise money to embark on a campaign to eradicate fistula in Tanzania altogether. So we made a pact that day to raise $15 million dollars and as I speak, we have raised $15 million. So through Vodafone across the world, the 27 market, our partners, uh, development partners around the world, my CEO, the Vodafone Group CEO, has taken this as a personal thing. So we've been raising money. We've been doing a massive campaign globally. We've called it a Moyo Challenge, the Vodafone Moyo Challenge. Moyo means hard. And it's all over the world. And for me to be able to inspire that, for my country is the biggest achievement I've ever done. And our plan is to be able to do that by 2016. So we have a proper plan and we're working with- You're gonna make me cry. Because <laughs> I can under, I, you know, I didn't realize, I knew you did great stuff in the community, but I am very familiar with the disease. And what an achievement. That is fantastic. Yeah. If there was one thing that you could attribute your success to, what would it be? I think, the way we grew up, my, my father was a politician all his life. Uh, I grew up seeing him work for people. So I grew up in the whole, he moved from one region to another because of his job. So I kind of grew up in most of Tanzania. I was always a new girl in school. And seeing him work for people, this country, and that was, it, it was his mandate. He's not a rich man. He just wanted to work for people of this country. And I grew up seeing that. And um, I, I took that, and he's a biggest inspiration in my life. That's why I want to be here for the service of others. Whatever I can do, whether in technology, in CSR, etc., is to do that. So I think it's my upbringing. I think it's my family, and uh, that has inspired me to be this. And I believe that I, I'm here for other people, and I'm blessed to have the education that I have and the drive that I have for others who can't otherwise do it for themselves. So, because I believe we are all here for a purpose. And if we, like what you're doing, you're inspiring women in Africa. So I believe my purpose is whatever I am at, is to deliver for others. And it's, it's kind of taken from how we were brought up. But my father is the biggest inspiration. What has been the biggest challenge that you've had in your career and how did you overcome it? The challenge is keep going keep being excellent and keep discovering and doing things in an extraordinary manner in our society. Because, not being sounding weird for our society, but we're used to mediocrity. We, we're used to, you know, getting by. Tomorrow will come, it's another day. But not really pushing the boundaries and, and, and getting things done in time and to deliver change as soon as it can. So that has been a challenge, to always try and stay excellent, because that's what I believe. I don't want to be a mediocre person. If I'm to do something, it has to be excellent, no matter what it will take me. So the challenge is really to stay there and not being pulled down by a lot of forces, which is a lot of people. You may find a lot of people around you think, what are you doing? Do you really have to do that now? We can do that tomorrow. So having that forces and you know going somewhere something is not done, it's broken when it should not be broken, could be easily fixed. So a lot of pressure to make you not excellent and for you to still want to stay there as the biggest challenge. Has there been an initiative that you've implemented that just didn't work, be it from a CSR perspective, a sales perspective, or a public affairs perspective, that you try to make work and you just did not work. If you can share one with us um, and what you would do differently now as a result of that. So um, when I finished my master's degree, before I started working for Google, I launched my, um, what I believed back then, it was in 2006, DVD magazine. I believe people could watch DVDs. People like to read a lot about other people and get inspired, like you know the normal magazines. So I thought I would launch. This was a personal uh, uh, thing. I would launch a DVD magazine where I'll go around and talk to people.
that can inspire other people and talk about lifestyle and, and sell that on the streets for people to buy and therefore the rewards that I, I thought I'll do every month one DVD magazine. So we'll record, I had a bit of a team with me, some people who believed in the idea, we put together the concept and we got the best people. Back then we got, there was the first Minister of Finance, she was a woman big business people, we got lifestyle hotels to sponsor us. So we went, we recorded, it was incredible. But then, it didn't work because no, nobody wanted to buy it. It was expensive and two were saying, well, I'm buying a magazine, I could read that, why would I watch it? These, you know, TVs everywhere, so it just didn't work. And people preferred to watch a TV program of the same. So it didn't work. It was. It was. I really believed in it. I was so passionate about it, and I believed it could work. And we had these amazing people who did our first maiden CD, but it just didn't work. And it was quite disappointing. And um, what I would do differently, I wouldn't do it. I'll do a TV show, perhaps, <laughs> in the same concept. How would you reflect pre, during, or post an initiative, and sort of measure the success? of something that you've implemented. You look at the impact that you want to make. That's a big thing that you will always measure the impact. The process may be, oh, oh, it will take a lot of journeys, but at the end of the day is that impact that you have set yourself to achieve. That's one. And in the so you, you outline that from the very beginning. If you deliver more than that, fabulous. But the impact that you want to to meet. And then the process to get getting as simple as possible, believe in simplicity, keep it simple, and don't tire, go for it. And after you've achieved it, now you look, did I really um, reach the target that I wanted to? That would be the success. Now this is what I call my edginess segment. And this is something that you've had to do that makes you uncomfortable, yes. but you need to continue to do it in order to achieve the success that you've achieved. Uh, and this is, uh, for me, would be um, not spending enough time with my family, my, my father, my mom, my friends, my daughter, because of how hectic my work is and how I've set myself for what are my, my, my measure of achieving things. So you find, I find myself spending a lot of time delivering my mandates at work and in the community and not so much time at home, especially when I have a, a massive project that I'm working on. I would love to be at home. There's some things that we've planned with my daughter or with my friends, but I have to forego those for my first my work to come first. And that, if that my work comes first, then I will achieve my goals the way I want them to. However, I forego an important, important part of my, my, my heart. That's my family, my friends, and my daughter. But that's how I have to do it, unfortunately. That's why we're here Saturday. Yes. <laughs> There's one thing you do differently in the pursuit of your success. What would it be? Perhaps strive to to stay positive more, because that's hard. I, I believe in positivity a lot. It takes me a long way, but with a lot of things that are happening, a lot of pressures, sometimes you become a bit negative. So one thing that I'll do different is try and be more positive. Deliberately strive to stay positive and, and, and be more positive. How do you define leadership? When you have a mandate to deliver for people or in an organization and um, realizing it. Because you may have a, man a mandate but you don't really embrace it and you don't realize, gosh, this is my role and I am stepping on this role and I'm going to do it the best way I can. So leadership for me is realizing you have a role to play and actually doing it and delivering on that mandate. If there were sort of three leadership lessons that you could provide to women or men for that matter, uh, what would those be? Number one would be go for it. Sky is the limit. Again, what sky? You know, if you have a mandate, you can grow and grow in it. So never look at a place and say this 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 will be my end. No, because you could go. Uh, we have ability to become anything we set ourselves to be. Number two, be humble. 
I believe it's, it's very important for a leader to be humble. And, 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 and you have people looking up to you for change or for a lot of things that people look up for leaders for. And humility is number one because you cannot be out of, there are good leaders out there, but then there is no traction, you don't inspire. You may change things, but you don't inspire other people to want to change also like you do. So humility is very key for a leader, humble and humility. And number three, I would say, is integrity and honesty. As a leader, those are very key. You may work so hard, but if you do not have those, it will come a point where everything will go and your legacy will just, will just walk out. So it kind of leads to what would you want your leadership legacy to be? Wow. I would want to be remembered by having impacted a lot of people's lives, either by doing things that they could not do for themselves or to inspire them to be the best people they can. Because a lot of people can become a lot of things, but you, you want to be inspired people to go out and be the best people that they are meant to be and they can be. I want to be remembered by that. Is there any techniques that you use? You have, I know six direct reports, about 50 people that report to you, that you use to try to ensure that happens for your employees. When I joined this role, I, I had a meeting with my people sort of lay down what my leadership style is and, and you know the usual open door policy you can really come to me and talk to me but I like to talk to people I have direct reports but everyone at the bottom can call me SMS me talk to me anytime for anything because I know they look up to me to be able to deliver their mandates as well so I want to inspire them as possible to really go for it themselves because they have all the capabilities to do it that's why they are here but sometimes they just need that that support to know that you're there but also with my direct reports I try and, and, and give them everything that I have for them to be the best they can so we have conversations I, I have my own style that I take my team every week I take one I take one of my direct reports to lunch to have a heart, heart and talk and let them open up you know tell escalate things they need to but not just work wise as people because I believe Part of leadership is not just for them to deliver the numbers, but also for them to grow as people. And it's my mandate to make sure that happens to them. So I give them as much as I can my own experiences, how I do things, and, and, and I'm excited about that. Given the chance, what would be the one thing you'd love to do that you haven't done yet? There's a lot of things I haven't done yet. <laughs> uh, so perhaps we can clarify. Personally, what, why? So it doesn't matter. Uh, this is your, it's up to you. You know what I say? When, if I live to be 50 years old, I will try and, 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 and hire a Harley Davidson and, and drive for, you know, do one of those tours with all the, the guys, you know, get into one and maybe go from Dar es Salaam to Morgari, two hour drive and I'll put on the leather things. Yeah, but can you imagine a 50 year old African I woman? I'm not sure what I'm laughing more about, <laughs> seeing you do it or that if you make it to 50 years old, I'm all of a sudden getting very old. <laughs> no, no, but no, I would no. like to do it at that, yeah. at that time, not okay. now, yeah. at that time. As far as your career goes, what, what is next for you? Well, there, there are many channels that my career can take. Um, I could go into group and work with a good friend group anywhere in the world as an option. Uh, whether in technology and enterprise sales or in public affairs. So there's a lot of options for me, but my heart is in Africa. And I, I believe whatever I will do, whether I'm in London or I am in South Africa, will be for Africa. I want to be able to drive a mandate, my, my organization mandate for Africa, if you know what I mean. This is where my heart is. Whatever I will do will be impacting Africa in my country. Now I know you have a daughter, yes. and let's assume, we're going to put the clock ahead a little bit, let's assume she's 10 years old, because you can have a very different conversation with a 10 year old than a 6 year old. What words of wisdom would you give to your 10 year old today? Well, I would tell her that you have 
anything it takes to go and rule the world. We already have a, that, 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 that the conversation now. She believes that women rock and women can rule the world in anything. So now she wants to be an astronaut. <laughs> so I don't know when we attend what it will be, but I will tell her, you can be anything you want to be. Just go for it. Wonderful. Now what, what do you wish you were told at 10 years old? When I was 10 years old, I wish I was told, go Mita, go rule the world. I think you're on your way, Mavita. <laughs> <laughs> because then I, you know, I would have thought global. I would have thought. I'm beginning to think that now, you know, after having been exposed. Perhaps if I was told that then, that would have exposed me much earlier, and maybe I would have been somewhere else now. But I don't regret it. It's it's been great. What words of wisdom would you like to give to African women? African women, uh, stay the course. Our, our, our continent needs us to evolve from where it is now. And if you're in a position to change that and make it faster, or at least change it, do it. And, and, and take it as a, take it really personal, because I believe our continent needs us to leapfrog from where it is now to the next, the next level. And it is possible, but it is up to us. So this is not just a goal that you do as a woman. If you are a leader in Africa today, really recognize that. And, and it's, it's a sacred role, I believe, that you have to think it like that and go for it. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your, your insights, your tactics and strategy, and your inspiration uh, with us today. Again, my name is Suzanne S. Stevens. And I am traveling around Africa with my husband, Michael K. Ginrek, as we're interviewing women leaders all over Africa. If you know a woman that should be interviewed on Wisdom Exchange TV, please email us at info at wisdomexchangetv.com. And we will research the woman and make sure she's a trailblazer, pioneer, or leader of many. Because we want to bring to you the women that were before you, or alongside you, or went behind you. These are the women that are the change agents. And please, once again, join us at Facebook fan page, Wisdom Exchange TV, and tell us who we should be interviewing, or comment on the women that we are interviewing. This is Wisdom Exchange. We need your voice to be heard as well. And I would just want to leave you with my words of wisdom. We talked a lot about things I'm very passionate about as well uh, today, and one of them is mediocrity. The company we own is Ignite Excellence, and we heard a lot of go for excellence. Mediocrity, there's no place for us in mediocrity. You may live a good life in mediocrity, but you'll live a phenomenal life of excellence, shooting for the stars. And you can see women like this that is really going to impact so many, because mediocrity is just unacceptable. Thank you for joining us.